Your next speaker today has been described by Smithsonian's Air and Space Magazine as the man who's flown everything. Does anybody have that issue? It's really cool if you don't have it. Among his astronaut peers, he was known as the best of the best, the Chuck Yeager of the astronaut corps, able to fly anything with a stick and throttle. From light piston aircraft to thundering fighters, from supersonic jets to the space shuttle, who has flown it? He was born in New York, grew up in California, and now resides in Tennessee with his wife, Dr. Ray Seddon, a three-time shuttle astronaut. After earning a degree in aeronautical engineering from Cal Poly Tech, didn't know that or didn't remember that, Captain Gibson entered into active duty with the <coughs> Navy. He saw duty aboard the USS Coral Sea and the USS Enterprise flying combat missions in Southeast Asia. Since graduating first in his class at Navy Test Pilot School and graduating the Navy Fighter Weapons School, better known as Top Gun, who has flown 14,000 hours in 136 types of civilian and military aircraft, a number that includes over 300 carrier landings. Captain Gibson was selected as a NASA astronaut in 1978 and is a veteran of five shuttle missions. He was selected for extraordinary missions, serving as mission pilot on his first and commander on the remaining four which included flights aboard STS-41B in 1984 on Challenger, STS-61C uh, in 86 on Columbia, 27 uh, in 1988 on Atlantis, STS-47 in 1992 on Endeavor, that was a space lab mission, and STS-71 in 1995 on Atlantis, which was the first docking with the Russian space station Mir. Hoot has spent a total of 36 and a half days in space, Captain Gibson was also Chief Astronaut and Deputy Director of Flight Crew Operations. He is an aeronautical engineer, a Navy aviator, test pilot, astronaut, world record holder, Space Camp Hall of Fame member, and I think most importantly to all of us, a very good friend to the Space and Rocket Center. So thank you again for being here. We appreciate that. Well, thank you. I, I look forward to any opportunity to come up here to Space Camp and get to talk to people, and especially Tweet Up. It's a lot of fun doing Tweet Up. I've only done one before, uh, but they are a lot of fun. So we are certainly glad all of you are here. And what I'm going to tell you about today is how we fly space shows. Uh, how they actually launch, how they operate in orbit, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the simple math that the astronauts have for rules of thumb and for things to help us figure out if we've got enough fuel, how much speed do we need, that sort of thing. Uh, this is the only space shuttle that I never flew. <laughs> this is the space shuttle Discovery, and my wife flew that on her first mission, but it's the one I never flew. Uh, I flew Challenger, and then Columbia, then Atlantis, then Endeavor, and all I needed was Discovery, and they made me fly Atlantis a second time. <laughs> so I didn't get to fly Discovery. Uh, well, this was my first space shuttle the night before launch. And, of course, as you can see, this is the space shuttle Challenger. And you probably know that when we would launch, what we'll do is about seven seconds prior to liftoff, we ignite these three big engines that are on the back of the space shuttle, liquid fuel. They're burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that comes out of the big orange fuel tank. Then if everything has looked good during the ignition sequence, the engines are up and operating just the way they ought to, then we're going to ignite the two big white solid rocket motors. And I didn't mention, but the three engines on the shuttle give us a million and a half pounds of thrust. One and a half million pounds of thrust. Shucks, that's nothing. Each of the booster rockets has three million. So when we ignite those two booster rockets, now we have seven and a half million pounds of thrust. We only weigh four and a half million pounds. That sounds funny. We only weigh four and a half million pounds. But if you divide thrust by mass, you can see that we lift off at just about two times the force of gravity. Two Gs of acceleration right at liftoff. And it looks so slow, I know, as it goes climbing up past the tower, but by the time our tail is up to the top of this tower, we're already over 100 miles an hour. So it really gets up and goes. Uh, there's not a Corvette on the Earth that will go that fast. So really an exciting ride. 
Um, we go through supersonic, the speed of sound, in about 40 seconds from liftoff, accelerating straight up. And I will just never forget, on my first mission, uh, at about a minute and a half after liftoff, looking at the Mach meter, and of course Mach is the speed of sound. So Mach 1 is the speed of sound, and at sea level, that's 760 miles an hour. As it goes up in altitude, the speed actually decreases, the speed of sound. But I remember looking at the Mach meter going through Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, and saying to myself, holy smokes, I've never even been Mach 3 before. I had been Mach 2 a bunch of times in jet fighters, but not Mach 3. And here I am accelerating straight up through Mach 3 a minute and 30 seconds after liftoff. So pretty exciting ride. Uh, this is not one of my launches, but it's <coughs> such a pretty picture. I just had to throw it in here. This is a, obviously a nighttime launch of a space shuttle, and we're looking at it from up north in Florida, so somewhere up around Jacksonville or Daytona Beach, somewhere up in there. And, of course, the reflection in the intercoastal waterway just makes it a really gorgeous picture. This is one of my launches. This was my second launch. And this is where we are at the end of two minutes. I can tell it's two minutes because the big smoke trail has dissipated, which means we have burned out the two big white solid rocket motors, because those burn out at the end of two minutes, and we dropped those off. Now, in this picture, it looks like we're going down. We're really not. At no time during the launch sequence are we going downhill. But we are already, at the end of two minutes, 30 miles up, 30 miles out over the Atlantic Ocean, and already going 3,000 miles an hour. So it really gets up and goes. The reason it looks like we're going down, we're following the curvature of the Earth, because we have to turn our velocity into horizontal speed, horizontal velocity. And what's happening at the end of two minutes is we are dropping off our two solid rocket motors. Those are held to the fuel tank, to the attached points on the fuel tank, by explosive bolts. And so we blow those explosive bolts, and you can see there are rocket thrusters, rocket motors, on the nose and tail of those booster rockets to push them away from us because when you cut them loose, you really don't want to run back into them again. <laughs> so we have those rocket thrusters, and they're about 85,000 pounds of thrust each. And they push those rocket boosters away from us so that we don't impact them. Those fall down in the ocean, and NASA has their own fleet. NASA has two ships. They're called Liberty and Freedom. And those two ships go out there and recover the booster rockets and tow them back into port, and we would take them apart, refurbish them, and fill them back up with fuel and use them over again. So that was the, the only part that we would throw away is the big orange fuel tank. And we would continue after we've dropped off the booster rockets for another six and one half minutes the rest of the way to orbit. And at that point, we would have reached orbital speed which is 17,500 miles per hour. And you get to that speed in just eight and a half minutes. To put that into perspective, I'll bet if I told all of you, go hop in your car right now. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but if I told you, go hop in your car right now, I'll bet it would take longer than eight and a half minutes to get to your car. So it's a pretty quick, pretty exciting ride. The tank drops off and falls down into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, out in the middle of the ocean where there's hopefully nobody out there. And we actually put notices up to the, the world airline fleet and to shipping and all that so that they'll know, hey, we're planning to launch a space shuttle on such a day, and we're gonna be dropping a fuel tank in this area at such and such a time. Please find yourself not there. <laughs> and so, uh, airliners won't fly through that area, I know, because one of our astronauts got stranded in Fiji, and they had to wait a couple of hours for that to expire uh, before they could go. Now, we are not quite in an established orbit at that point, and that's why the tank falls back down into the atmosphere and falls into the ocean. So we have to do something, and that's something that we do 
is we burn our smaller rocket motors that are on the back of the space shuttle. And this is a picture taken later on in the flight because at the time we're doing this burn, the doors are still closed, the payload bay doors. And in this picture, obviously, the only way we can get pictures of those rocket motors is once the cargo bay doors have been opened. And this is one of those burns where we can calculate just how long we need to burn ourselves. Uh, for example, if we know that perigee, our low point in the orbit, is 20 miles at present, and we need it to be 160 miles, we know that we need to make up 140 miles, and it's going to take about two feet per second per mile. So therefore, we know we need to burn 280 feet per second. That just happens to be 140 seconds, because each of these motors gives us one foot per second per second. So we can actually do a rough calculation in our own mind to say, OK, the, the onboard computer solution looks pretty good. We double checked it, and that looks pretty good. This comes in real handy when you have malfunctions. If we, in the simulator, for example, had had an engine failure, and we have an underspeed when we shut down and drop the tank, we know that we've got to have at least an 80 mile high perigee or low point in our orbit. So you'll do a quick calculation and say, okay, we need to burn this many feet per second and then we'll just do that ourselves. We won't necessarily have to tell the computer to do it. We'll just do the burn ourselves. And we know exactly how many feet per second we've got to burn to arrive at an 80 mile perigee. So that's where it isn't real heavy math. It isn't calculus, although I'm sure you could do it with calculus, but it isn't real heavy math. But that's one of the things that we keep as a, a hip pocket number uh, so that we can very quickly decide how much we need to burn and if we've got the right kind of burn going. This is what the cockpit <coughs> looks like. And if you're a pilot, have we got any pilots in the group? No pilots in the group? Okay, what I was going to say was, if you're a pilot and you look at the cockpit of a space shuttle, you will recognize more things in the cockpit than the things you will not recognize because it's just a big airplane. It's another great big airplane that flies a whole lot higher and a whole lot faster than most airplanes, but it has an attitude gyro, it has a compass. <coughs> so the things that you see in a space shuttle cockpit are pretty much like what you'd see in a big jumbo jet. It's got a few more switches. We can't see them all, but all the overhead panels up here are covered with switches. The wall over here is covered with switches over here, too. The aft cockpit has a ton of switches. And then downstairs, in what's called the mid-deck, there's another gazillion switches downstairs. So it has altogether uh, over 1,500 switches in the cockpit. That's why it takes you three and a half years to learn how to fly one in the first place. What did we do once we're up there? Well, on my first mission, we did this. We sent two of our guys outside to do a, the world's first untethered spacewalk. And you can see in this picture, this is a picture of Bruce. I can tell it's Bruce because he has the red stripes on his suit. That's how we could tell our spacewalkers apart. If they have their visor down, you can't tell which one's which. But EV-1 is Bruce, and he had the red stripes on the legs on his suit. Now what he's doing is he's flying a rocket pack. And this was the first time this had ever been done. And I'm sure that all of you have probably seen this photograph before, or photographs similar. And I know you've wondered, who was the brilliant photographer <laughs> who took these pictures? And as the co-pilot on this flight, which was my first mission to space, as the co-pilot, I was the only person that had absolutely nothing to do <laughs> while this spacewalk was taking place. So I'm parked at the window taking pictures, and they used the rocket pack to fly kind of far away, and again, not tethered to the space shuttle at all in any form. And I get a couple of questions. One of them was, hey, Hoot, did you ever get to do a spacewalk? And the answer I always give is no, uh, because I was a pilot astronaut, 
and we are far too valuable to rent us. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't get to do any spacewalks, but we carry lots of scientists, astronauts, and mission specialists, and we can send a couple of them out, and hopefully they'll come back. <laughs> In actuality, the reason that's done is because we spend so much time training on launch, re-entry, landing, aborts, vehicle systems, rendezvous, docking, all of those kinds of things, to even out the training time, they get to do all the spacewalks. The other question I get all the time is, holy smokes, he is really hanging out there. What if he runs out of fuel? What if he has a malfunction in his rocket pack? Well, the answer is we could fly Challenger over to pick him up because we have rocket thrusters pointing every which direction, these little round dots, would let us fly Challenger over to get him <coughs> if he comes up with the right amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> now the way it all worked out, it worked perfectly. No malfunctions, no difficulties with it, they didn't run out of fuel, and I'm sitting up in this window right here taking those pictures, uh, looking out the window at them. So we did have a way that we could go save them if something went wrong with their backpack thruster unit. Uh, but it, as I say, it all worked out very perfectly. And then the very next mission after this one used the rocket pack to fly over to a disabled satellite to uh, attempt to grab a hold of it and bring it back into the cargo bay so it could be repaired. So this has been used uh, in satellite rescues on a number of occasions. My last mission, um, as Charity mentioned, I got to go meet up with the Russians, dock with the Russians up in space. And this was the first docking that a space shuttle ever did. Uh, so I got to be the one to train on how to, how to dock. And where I'm going to attach is up on this end of the um, space station on a, uh, a module called Kristall. And the Russians had built the space station over a number of launches. This was one launch, this was one launch, this was another one, this was another one, the node was another one, and Kristall was another one. So they had built it gradually over the space of nine years. So it was nine years old by the time we went up there. They had built a docking port on Kristall intending to send their space shuttle to it. You probably know the Russians built a space shuttle. It looks like a carbon copy of ours. Because <laughs> why go to all that trouble of designing your own when you can just copy ours? And so that's pretty much what happened. But it only flew one time, completely unmanned, and then the Soviet Union crumbled apart and they never flew it again. So it never went to space with people in it at all. Now this was a real challenge, a real piloting challenge, because rendezvous and docking in our space program is flown manually by the commander. So at this point, I'm flying Atlantis manually. Oh, you're going to miss Snip and Snippy. I'm coming. <laughs> you're going to miss Snip and Snippy. Um, and what I have to do, okay, just long enough for me to get through Snip and Snoopy. I'm just going. Um, what I have to do is I'm flying Atlantis manually at this point, and we are both going 17,500 miles an hour. And what I have to do is fly our docking ring, which is about a four foot diameter ring, up here in the cargo bay, up and into contact with the docking ring up on the Mir space station. And they said, okay, Hoot, you can be sloppy. You just have to line them up within two inches. <laughs> and the contact velocity has to be one-tenth foot per second. Okay, one-tenth of a foot per second. Well, one-tenth of a foot is 1.2 inches per second. So that's a closure rate of about this fast. So no faster than that. They said if you hit them at two tenths of a foot per second, you will break the docking mechanism. And no pressure, but there will be five billion people watching on television <laughs> because this was the first docking ever done by a space shuttle. Now, the, some of the mathematics that were involved in docking the reason that we're doing an approach, you can see in this picture, we're down below the space station, coming up from below. We didn't want to ever get a high closure rate to where we'd have to put on the brakes. How do we put on the brakes? We fire our thrusters that are pointing up. 
And if we ever fired our thrusters that were pointing up, all of these solar panels are extremely fragile. And I'd probably strip all the solar panels off the mirror. The vehicle would fail and it would start World War III. <laughs> so we didn't want that to happen. So we didn't want to have to fire any braking pulses. So the approach from underneath allows us to just stop firing the thrusters, coast to a stop, and then start firing the thrusters again. Now one of the, one of the funny things we had was we had two methods of approach. One was called SNP, and the other one was called SNPY. And we actually used SNP, which stood for Shuttle Nose In Plane. So in this picture, we are going this way. We're cruising over the earth, going towards us, sitting out here, on the, uh, out here in the room. And the nose is in the plane of motion. Okay, so that's SNP. On a SNP approach, from training in the simulator, we figured out that at any range to go, if our closure rate was two times range divided by a thousand, we would coast to a stop and not have to fire our braking pulse. So for example, if we're 300 feet out, two times 300 is 600, divided by 1,000 is 0.6 feet per second. So at 300 feet, as long as I'm not closing any faster than, than uh, 0.6 feet per second, I can coast to a stop and not have to fire any braking pulses. Okay, what's Snoopy? Really clever. Snoopy is shuttle nose out of plane yaw. <laughs> Which means, if we had been 90 degrees, in other words, pointing this way and translating to the left, in the example I've just depicted, with the shuttle nose out of plane in the yaw axis, we could only do one and a half times range divided by a thousand. And that's because when we thrust sideways, it causes more closure rate. So we didn't use Snoopy. But I thought it was kind of cute that we had two approach methods known as SNP and Snoopy. So you probably haven't heard about Snoopy before in space. <coughs> but those were the two approaches that we used. Okay, now that I've made it sound real difficult, it went really well. And the reason was we had done this probably a hundred times in the simulator. And all of the dockings that we did in the simulator were completely successful unless someone called Sim Soup. Simulation supervisor is the bad guy. They're the ones that throw in all the malfunctions. So if they threw in a malfunction to where the docking mechanism didn't work, we'd come in, hit them at one-tenth of a foot per second, and bounce off. And the rule was, if we don't capture and we bounce off, we have to back away and give mission control a chance to look at it and figure out why, what went wrong, what do we need to do before we try it again. Uh, the other big challenge was, we're firing thrusters, we're using fuel the whole time, and we didn't want to exceed our fuel budget. If you exceed your fuel budget, they're going to tell you, okay, the docking's off, bring it home. So we sure didn't want that to happen. Okay, so it all worked great, and the protocol was that I, as the shuttle commander, would shake hands with Vladimir Dejurov, the Mir commander, and we had to have live television to Moscow, live television to Houston, because this was a big moment. <coughs> and the President of the United States went on television that night and announced that this handshake marked the end of the Cold War. So now you, all, you know it was me that ended the Cold War. <laughs> well, we got to spend five days docked with the Mir space station. Uh, Mir is spelled M-I-R, the way we spell it, and it's a Russian word that actually has two meanings. It means world, and it also means peace in Russian. Uh, we spent five days, Dr. Mir, and this is a picture that we shot from the Mir space station, looking out over the nose of the shuttle, and in this picture, we are over, this is the Black Sea that's underneath us here. This is the Crimean Peninsula, and the Dnieper River flowing into the Black Sea. Under the cloud mass, this is Turkey, and so uh, Istanbul is right about in here, and you are actually able to see all the way across the Mediterranean and just barely the northern coast of Africa in this picture. 
So it's really a cool view that we have from orbit. And I haven't shown this picture down at Space Camp before, but I keep getting told I should show this one. Oh, yeah. uh, we shot this photo from, this was shot from the Mir space station with me looking out the window, obviously. And we're up, you can see, 250 miles uh, in this picture. And just kind of a cool shot. I tell people it was probably worth working there for 18 years just to get this photo. <laughs> so, kind of a neat picture. I mentioned we stayed there for five days and we undocked on the 4th of July and the way we got this photograph. Oh, huh. how in the world did okay. we get this photograph? We didn't send somebody outside. Satellite. It wasn't shot from a UFO. <laughs> the Russians rocket called Soyuz, I didn't point it out before, but Soyuz is gone. So the two Russians who were staying behind for five months, they came up with me in Atlantis and I picked up Vladimir and the other two who had been up there for four months and gave them a ride back to Earth. And the two that were staying behind climbed into Soyuz, their little Russian capsule, came out to the side 200 feet so they could take pictures of us right as we're getting ready to leave and then as we're separating away. <laughs> uh, we actually flew around the mirror three times so that we could get photography of it from all different angles. And then Soyuz, <coughs> this is Soyuz right here, Reduct, uh, which is a capsule kind of like a small Apollo capsule. It has three seats in it, uh, just like Apollo did, but it's really a cramped, tight little cockpit. And they reduct back to the space station, and as I mentioned, stayed there for another five months. I showed you one of the nice views that we had from orbit. We really get spoiled by the views of the Earth that you get to see. Uh, this is a hurricane, of course, and this is actually Hurricane Bonnie that we shot on my fourth mission in September of 92. And you can very clearly see the eye of the hurricane and all those spiral bands that wrap out around the, around the storm with all these huge embedded thunderstorms and tornadoes and things that go along with a hurricane. So just no fun at all. We shot this picture on my first mission of the tallest mountain in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, which of course is a big shield volcano uh, rising up out of the Eastern Rift Valley in Africa. But what if you caught a volcano just as it was exploding, just as it was erupting, you might see something that looked like this. And you can see where this eruption has burned a hole through the clouds with all the heat. It's trapped a bunch of cloud up on top of the ash and is pushing it way up high into the stratosphere. You can see all kinds of pyroclastic flows down the, down the flanks of this volcano. So you wouldn't want to be there on the ground watching this one. So pretty, pretty cool photo. Uh, we shot this picture on my third mission, and it looks like Greenland, uh, because it is Greenland. <laughs> and my third mission was a secret classified Department of Defense mission, which just coincidentally took us way up north over the Soviet Union. And so we were able to get this picture of Greenland. Uh, kind of interesting things in the photo, though, are airliners. You can see all these airliner contrails because the North Atlantic is a real busy air route between Europe and the United States. And so just about any time you're up in the Northern Hemisphere, you can look out and see all these contrails of airliners uh, crisscrossing the world. So kind of a pretty picture. Uh, we shot this one on my fourth mission, and this is the delta of the Nile River. And Right over here at the tip of the delta is Cairo. This is the Suez Canal going from the Mediterranean into the Red Sea. And right up by Cairo, of course, the bright spot in the sand, that's where the pyramids are. So you can actually kind of pick that out from orbit. Uh, here's a view, same area, a little bit more to the west looking from the west toward, towards the east. And again, the Nile River, uh, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. What do you suppose 
this looks like at night. Looks kind of pretty at night. Mm -hmm. Looks really spectacular at night. And interesting thing that the lights show us, obviously, is where's all the civilization? Well, there's lots of it right along the Nile River. And you move off the Nile, you're into the Sahara Desert or the Sinai. And there's not a whole lot of civilization once you move off the Nile River. Cairo really shines brightly. Alexandria and Israel along the the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea pretty well lit up and then up towards the Greek Isles up, up to the north. Okay, here's a quiz. Here's identification of another part of the world. This is too easy. Florida, yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of a pretty picture as well uh, because we can see all the way down to Key West and the Florida Keys. Um, let's see, I think this must be Bermuda out here. And we can see the moon shining off the water. So really kind of a pretty picture. Okay, I got one more pretty nighttime picture for you. This one is way too easy. <laughs> but another just real pretty picture, obviously Italy and Sicily. And in this picture, this green glow that's at the horizon is something that we refer to as the air glow. That's the Earth's atmosphere. So you can actually see it at night. It's about 85 miles high, and it picks up the light from all of the light that's down there on the Earth and gives us, uh, gives us actually a visual indication of just how thick the air is uh, that's around the Earth. And we get lots of opportunities to shoot pictures like this, sunrises and sunsets, and the reason is we're going around the Earth every 90 minutes. It only takes an hour and a half to go all the way around the Earth. So therefore, we are in the daylight for 45 minutes, dark for 45 minutes, daylight for 45 minutes. Sun goes up and down 16 times a day when we're up in orbit. OK, what's the prettiest thing we get to see from space, though? I was doing a talk here at Space Camp, and we were over in the Davidson Theater. And I said to the, we had all the young people in there, I said, what's the prettiest thing that we get to see from space? And some little kid said, Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Las Vegas. It's the aurora. And on a high, what we call a high inclination orbit, which is when we go up to 57 degrees north and down to 57 degrees south, we get up by the aurora. Only not just one aurora. We get to see the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere. Then there's the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere. So there's the northern lights and the southern lights. And it is just fascinating to watch because it's moving. And I'm sure many of you have seen <coughs> the aurora here down on the Earth. It's moving. It's changing colors. It's dancing. It's shifting. It's going up and down in altitude. And you can see in this picture, it's an upper atmosphere effect, and we're up above the atmosphere, so we're up above the aurora. So we look down on the aurora. And over the years, at least on my missions anyway, we've trained mission control. Hey, if we're up by the aurora, don't bother calling us. <laughs> we're not going to talk to you. Everybody's looking out the window. So just leave us alone. But it is just spectacular to get to see. Okay, when we come back into land, we hit the Earth's atmosphere, still going 17,500 miles an hour. And this is what we re-enter at. This is the kind of attitude that we fly in. We're 40 degrees nose high, and so in this picture, the flow is coming from this side, and you can see that we create this enormous, huge shock wave around the vehicle, and the temperature in that shock wave is 9,000 degrees. And there's not a metal on Earth that will tolerate 9,000 degrees. So that's the purpose of all these thermal tiles and all the thermal insulation that's around the shuttle, which is only made out of aluminum, to protect the aluminum from all of those temperatures. So we have those very thick black tiles underneath the orbiter, white tiles on top, and thermal blankets as well, because we've got to protect that mere metal 
from all these kinds of 9,000 degree temperatures. So it's a pretty exciting ride coming back in during the re-entry. Looking out your window, this is what you see. It looks like you're flying through a blowtorch because 9,000 degrees, the air actually dissociates. In other words, the nitrogen molecules, N2, breaks up into N and N. And O2, oxygen, breaks up into O and O. And that causes a, um, a plasma, a glowing plasma, is what you turn the air into right outside your window. So right outside your window, you've got 9,000 degree temperatures. So it's pretty exciting <laughs> flying back down. Every so often, you'll see a bunch of sparks go by the windshield, and you'll go, what was that? Was that a couple of tiles coming <laughs> off? And usually, it's the, the little gap fillers, things that are in between each individual tile. Sometimes those come loose and break away, and of course, they immediately burn up uh, at that kind of temperature. So it's a pretty exciting ride coming back down. And I think you know that when we're back in the atmosphere, we don't have any engines. We are a 110-ton glider. And so you get exactly 1.0 attempts to land it. So we train the pilots very, very extensively. Uh, a co-pilot, before his or her first mission, uh, will have had at least 500 practice landings in our in-flight simulator that simulates the space shuttle. And a mission commander is going to have at least 800 uh, before he or she is going to command the space shuttle. And you've probably seen it. We hold the wheels inside right up to the last second because we glide like kind of a smooth brick with the gear up. And we glide like a real bumpy brick with the gear down. <laughs> so we hold the landing gear until we're 300 feet above the ground. And then we throw the gear out. And people ask me all the time, what are you going to do if one of, your, one of your wheels doesn't come down? I tell them, we've decided we're going to land anyway. <laughs> <laughs> As if you had a choice. Uh, but what we have is the gear is hydraulically controlled. So we hit an arm button that's covered with a plastic cover to keep you from hitting it accidentally. And then we hit a down button, which is covered with a clear plastic guard to keep you from hitting it accidentally, because you wouldn't want to do this up in orbit. We have no way to raise the gear once the gear comes out. So you really don't want to put your landing gear down up in space. So it's very much covered and protected. And in fact, we even pull a circuit breaker when we're up in orbit to make sure that it would be tragic if you put your gear down in orbit, because you can't survive the re-entry. You'd have openings in the bottom, bottom of the space shuttle, which won't work. So we drop the gear and touch down. Our touchdown speed is 205 knots, which is about 235 miles per hour, is, is our landing speed. And then we've got this cool looking drag chute, red, white, and blue. Really doesn't do anything, but it really looks cool. <laughs> Actually, it does a lot. It used to be. Before we got the drag chute in 1992, and we started flying the space shuttles in 1981. We didn't get the drag chute until 1992, the middle of 1992. Prior to that, the only thing we had to stop with was these four tires and brakes had all the brakes on them, and you've got a 220,000 pound vehicle going 230 miles an hour. It's going to take a lot of energy to get the thing stopped. And it wasn't unusual to destroy the brakes in the course of a normal landing. And once we got the drag chute, shoot, life was easy for the brakes from then on. So really made a big difference uh, in our ability to get stopped and have lots of margin uh, once we got the drag chute. And then if you've done everything right, if you've done everything right and you survive the mission, you get back on the ground, you get to pose for cool hero photos, <laughs> like this one. And I have to admit, we got out of the vehicle, the four of us. There were still uh, four others, uh, the three Russians who had been in space for four months. And we pretty much put them in a wheelchair and wheeled them off because they haven't been walking or standing or working against gravity now for four months. They are very physically deconditioned. And then one of our doctors, uh, Dr. Ellen Baker, 
was helping with the three cosmonauts. So Ellen and the three cosmonauts are not in this picture. The rest of us went walking around looking at the looking at the landing gear, looking at the tiles, um, you know, kicking the tires, that kind of thing. And at the end of it, the NASA photographer said, hey, let me get a picture of you guys out in front of the vehicle. So we walked out there, and he said, okay, give me a big thumbs up. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is so cheesy. But you know what? It made a cool picture. So I actually show the picture. So it did, it did, make, a, it did make a pretty good shot. Well, last year in July, uh, my whole family and I went down to Cape Canaveral to watch this, the very last launch of the space shuttle, July the 8th, 2011. This was the 135th launch of the space shuttle. And it was my space shuttle that I'd flown twice, the space shuttle Atlantis. So this was the very last launch. This is a picture of the very last re-entry shot from the International Space Station. You can see that flaming trail uh, of plasma shot in the atmosphere, again, from the space station as they were flying their re-entry. They came back into Cape Canaveral and landed kind of in the middle of the night, as I recall, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, something like that, to mark the very end of the space shuttle program and what a legacy they've left behind and here's where you're going to be able to see them now the only three that we have left of the shuttles that actually went to space are discovery atlantis and endeavor and discovery is now washington dc out at dulles airport in the utvar Azi museum and this is a picture of Discovery on display. It's a very popular exhibit, as you can see, uh, from all the people crowding around it. Atlantis will be down at Cape Canaveral, and we probably all saw on the news Endeavor arriving out in Los Angeles. I think they shut down schools and business and everything so that everybody could go outside and take pictures of Atlantis flying over, I'm sorry, Endeavor flying over LA. It's going to go into the Science and Industry Museum, I think it's called, uh, there in Los Angeles. So that's <coughs> where our space shuttles are all going to be. But what a legacy they have left behind. In order of their first flight, they were Columbia, which flew 28 times. These were all the crew emblems from Columbia. Uh, I flew it on, in 1986, and this was my crew patch. Uh, let's see, my wife flew it twice on STS-40 and STS-53, and then you probably know we lost the crew of STS-103, Columbia, in early 2003, February the 1st of 2003. So 20, 28 missions just on Columbia. Challenger, you probably know we lost Challenger and her crew in 1986 her crew of seven on her 10th mission. I flew the fourth flight that Challenger had flown in 1984. Discovery was our fleet leader. Discovery flew 39 times altogether. And that's, as I mentioned, that's the only one I didn't fly. This was my wife's patch um, aboard Discovery. Uh, Atlantis <coughs> flew 33 times altogether. And I flew it on its third mission, and I flew it on its 14th mission, which was the Mir docking uh, with the Russians. And then Endeavour, Endeavour flew 25 times. Endeavour was the one built to replace Challenger. So even though it got a late start, uh, didn't come online until 1992, uh, Endeavour still flew 25 missions. I flew it on its second mission. Uh, which was my Space Lab flight that Charity mentioned. So they're going to leave a pretty proud heritage of 135 missions altogether over the space of 30 years. And to put 135 missions in perspective, if you look at our entire American space program prior to shuttle, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Apollo, Soyuz, and Skylab, 31 total launches and we flew shuttle 135 times. 
So it's really going to go down in history, I think, as one of the biggest advances in aviation ever. And in spite of having lost two of our shuttles and two, two bright crews, uh, it's, it's been quite a successful program. So with that, that's all the boring slides I was going to show you, and I don't know if we have, do we, if we, do we have time for questions? We have, we have time okay. for a couple of questions, and then um, following that I went and found a black Sharpie. A black Sharpie, okay. And, um, <laughs> who will uh, sign autographs and take photos, um, so we'll do a couple questions and then we'll do that. Yes, sir. So out of all the shuttle ones, which one did you like the best, like the launch experience or the landing experience? Because they all vary, right? They, you know, they're, they're as, as nearly as NASA could build them identical, they made them identical. Columbia had uh, some different control panels in it because it was the first one to fly. So it had a bunch of stuff in it that was called DFI, Developmental <coughs> Flight Instrumentation. So it had, it had some different control panels in it. I've got to say that my launch aboard Columbia, which was my second flight, my first mission as commander was by far the most interesting launch because we had malfunctions going all the way to orbit. <laughs> we lifted off and just passing by the tower we got our first warning tone and then shortly after that we got our second one and then at two minutes when the booster separated we got our third one. The second one was apparently a helium leak that if we leaked out all the helium out of this particular tank would cause one of our engines to shut down. And we don't want that to happen. And so we were fighting that thing virtually all the way to orbit. So it was by far the most interesting launch uh, <laughs> because we were just busy as could be uh, trying to get configured so that we could keep all three engines running. So that, that was the most interesting launch that I had. The most interesting flight had to be the mirror ducking uh, because this was only the second time that there had been an American and Russian docking. The one previous to that was the Apollo Soyuz docking in 1975. And this was only the second time that an American spacecraft had docked with a Russian spacecraft. And we had to attempt to learn to speak Russian <laughs> because they couldn't speak much of any English. And I describe it as attempt to learn to speak Russian. <coughs> Uh, because I are an engineer, <laughs> and engineers are pretty good with physics and math and science, but not languages. And, you know, the alphabet's even different. The Russian alphabet has 33 characters, and they're Greek, Arabic, and Cyrillic. And characters in Russian aren't even the same as they are in English, because like a capital H, that's not an H in Russian, that's an N. Now, capital B is not a B, as in boy. Capital B in Russian is a V. So the Russian name Victor starts with a capital B. And it ends with a P. <laughs> because a P is not a P at all. That's a Greek letter Rho. So that's an R. So Russian was not an easy language for a dumb engineer to try to learn. But it, it sure was a challenge. So that was fun. Anybody ask a question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you guys were linking with the mirror, you said you coasted to a stop. How do you coast in space when there's no atmosphere and there's no drive? The reason that we would coast to a stop is that we are below the mirror space station. And I'm going to have to describe how orbital mechanics works. Okay. Um, for every altitude up in orbit, there's only one correct speed for you to be going. So let's say here's the mirror up here, and here's a space shuttle down here. If I'm in a stabilized orbit down here below the mirror, I have to be going faster. Right. So I would be leaving it behind. But I'm staying right below it. So as a result, I'm too slow for the orbit I'm in. And if I don't fire thrusters, what will happen is I will fall back, drop down, and accelerate. So in order to prevent that from happening, you're constantly thrusting forward and thrusting up to come up towards the space station. So if I did, if I have the, the, the correct closure speed, no matter, no matter what distance away I am, if I'm at the correct closure rate 
and I stop thrusting, I will coast to a stop, and then I will drift back and drop down. So that's why. That's why. Okay. It's because of orbital mechanics. Okay. So we have a good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, this may sound silly, but no um, silly questions. We're in space camp. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had cousins who were fighter pilots during the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them taught Top Gun and everything. And I noticed they were very different mentally. I mean, they thought different than we did. They like one of them told me he never got a thrill flying a jet until he had to do a carrier mm -hmm. landing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is his thrill level. Do you get the training first and then the guts to get on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> or do you have that thrill sensation level so high that you go after the training to I, do that? Well, I went after it because, it's funny, I, I, I described the way I got to be an astronaut. Um, and that is, I grew up wanting to be a jet fighter pilot and an aeronautical engineer, just like my dad, That's what uh, the and, and a test pilot. My dad had been an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot, and so I knew from the time I was about 10 that's what I wanted to do. I really wasn't interested in space because it was capsules. It wasn't a flying machine. And I was looking through Aviation Week in 1974, and I saw the first artist concept of a space shuttle <coughs> flying a re-entry on its way down to land on a runway, and I looked at that and I said, I have got to get me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted, at that point, I changed my direction, well, not totally. I already knew I wanted to go be a test pilot, and I knew that if I wanted to be a space shuttle pilot, I would have to be a test pilot. Do you not have a little different mentality than most people walking around? Well, yeah, I'll give you another example. <laughs> yeah, you do. You're you sitting do. on top of a lot of... Four and a half million yeah. gallons of uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid yeah. oxygen. Yeah. It'd make a pretty good bomb <laughs> uh, if it doesn't go off the right way. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you, have to, you have to be a little crazy. You have to have... <laughs> Um, a whole bunch of confidence in the engineers and the people that build that stuff. And, but one of the reasons that I looked at this space shuttle was at the time I was flying F-14 Tomcats uh, in the Navy's first Tomcat squadron. Tom Cruise, eat your heart out. <laughs> uh, that's the airplane he was flying in the movie Top Gun, only he didn't really get to fly it. But I was flying those at the time and I said, space shuttle flies higher and faster than my Tomcat, I want to go fly that. And so there, there is, you know, I suppose there's a little bit of a thrill seeker mm -hmm. in fighter pilots. The other thing that I frequently talk about is uh, what I just finished in September of this year. People used to ask me, okay, who, what are you going to do for excitement once you stop flying rockets? And the answer I would always give was, well, I would really like to fly and race in the unlimited class in the Reno Air Races. <laughs> and I've been doing that since 1998. So, and you've got to be maybe more than a little bit crazy to do that. <laughs> so, I lived out there, I did that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, I just finished uh, second overall in September. Wow, okay, yeah. uh, at 456 miles an hour average. Um, and you're flying eight airplanes at a time, uh, 70 feet above mm -hmm. the ground, around a set of pylons. So, <laughs> you were saying they were a little bit unbalanced. <laughs> no, not unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> I just said they thought differently well, than yes. the rest of the cousins. <laughs> and, and all of the astronauts that I knew thought a little bit differently as well. Uh, and it was kind of amazing uh, that I met my wife and your wife is that way. My <laughs> wife, we were in the same class, the 1978 astronaut class, which was the first space shuttle class. And she, Ray Seddon is her name, and she kept her maiden name, was one of the original six women astronauts selected in the U.S. Now, I could understand all the fighter pilots wanting to go fly space shuttles. She grew up in the South um, and was a medical doctor but she had a private pilot's license, so she was a pilot. And she said, 
I want to go fly these things. And so she and I spent 18 years there, and uh, she flew to space three times and had three kids along the way as well. Mm -hmm. And I can understand, like I say, the fighter pilots want to do it, but there's plenty of women that want to do it as well That's who right. had backgrounds that were totally disconnected from anything yeah, close to being a fighter pilot. Yeah, we do. We sure do. And I, every time I talk to young people, I always ask the question, okay, is it only boys that get to grow up and be astronauts? And the girls all know the answer. They go, uh-uh, uh, -uh. Uh, uh Girls get to be astronauts too. Girls get to be space shuttle commanders as well. So we need to point that out to our young women and make sure they know that, hey, you can be an engineer, you can be a scientist, you can be a test pilot, you can be a fighter pilot, uh, you can be a bomber pilot, but why would you want to? You can be a fighter pilot. <laughs> So, yeah, we need to make sure that they all understand that there are lots of doors that, uh, that they ought to go knock on. So, yeah, very good. Come on back over here, So, I'm curious, um, <coughs> when you're flying the, the MIR mission, so when you're first introduced and you're in training, is there an aha moment when everybody realizes that the equipment's going to match up with no other up. issues? Well, um, yes. The reason, the reason we knew that it would match up is because the actual docking portion where we were going to attach to Mir, we bought that from the Russians. <laughs> so, now we had to adapt it into the space shuttle, and so what we did was we had a, uh, a fixture that had to do with the space lab that we could integrate their docking mechanism uh, into our space lab tunnel and all the connecting structures. So we you know, you're never 100%, but we were certainly 99% that everything was going to work fine. And sure enough, it did. Uh, the docking mechanism is like a, uh, golly, it's like a Swiss watch. It was the most complicated, ridiculous looking thing you've ever seen. It had electrical dampers, it had physical dampers, uh, it had springs, it had electric motors, it had electric hooks, and all these things on it. And it worked like a Swiss watch. We actually got to meet the, uh, the Russian engineer, Vladimir Siromyatnikov, that designed the thing. And he personally showed us. And he's pointing to it and speaking in Russian. And we're nodding our heads, <laughs> pretending like we understand what he's saying, and uh, answering questions and things like that. But yeah, it, it, uh, we were very much confident it was going to work.